um, welcome to the 1030 service. Uh, this is the first time I've ever said that. It's really exciting. Today's the first Sunday we've ever had two services. And so if you're here, you're a pioneer. You might not even know it, but you've accomplished a lot today. That's a win for you. And some of you, let's be honest, you needed a win. It's been a while. And so there you go. You've, you've done a lot. And you're like, man, I, all I did was show up. How many people know with God, half the battle is just showing up? If you show up, God will show up too. And so I'm really glad that you came today, especially to the 1030. Um, you got some extra sleep. These are the more spiritual people. How many know God's not up till at least nine? You know, come on. You got some extra sleep. And so you're excited. And another way that we celebrated today, you know, when you're only five months old, as a church, there's a lot of firsts, and, and, and so today was our first Sunday with two services, and the way that we celebrated that was we had baptism in between services. We had a bunch of people getting baptized, giving their life to the Lord. It was absolutely awesome. We could clap for that. Come on, it's more fun when we all clap, and so it was great. You know, my favorite thing about doing baptisms is uh, uh, there's always people that sign up and, you know, they plan on it, but there's always people who get baptized who don't plan on it, and that's really, really exciting. I remember about a year ago, as a part of the service we had a guy get baptized in a three-piece suit. Come on, how many people know he didn't plan on that, you know? Only God could compel somebody to get baptized in a three-piece suit. It was really exciting. It was beautiful. And that's because baptism is beautiful. Um, you know, what we like to say around here, baptism is an outward expression of an inward devotion. It is going public in your relationship with God. It is making your Facebook status with Jesus to in a relationship. Right? And, and, and no matter if you've been in church for 25 minutes or for 20 years, some of us, we've never done that before, if we're being honest. And so we're a Christian, but a lot of people wouldn't even know it. You know, it's like a secret. And so, and so it's a good thing to get baptized. And so today we had baptism, and the, the baptismal is still out there. And so if you'd like to get baptized, let us know. We will definitely have another one coming up here pretty soon. Um, and so it's just an exciting thing to, to go public um, with you following Jesus. You know, everything in the New Testament about following Jesus it's all about taking that which God has done for you in private and making it public so other people can get in on it, so other people get encouraged. Because we like to say around here, when you believe in Jesus in private, you will go to heaven. But when you follow Jesus in public, heaven comes to you. Anybody want heaven to come to you? Yeah, amen. And so and for some people, that was baptism today, which is really, really exciting. And the water was what? It was, it was kind of cold. And we had someone say, hey, it seemed kind of crazy. You know, it was kind of cold to jump in the water when it's cold. But how many people know that heaven's looking for some crazy people? Not just people who are going to play it safe and be comfortable all the time and wait till you get to heaven to see God move. But people say, you know what, I'm going to get a little uncomfortable for the Lord. Heaven's looking for people in a three-piece suit to jump into the water and say, man, I'll go all in for the Lord. And so it was a great time that we had earlier today. If you'd like to get baptized, we have another one coming up. And so we'd love to hear from you. But today, really excited to wrap up our series, In Awe. Has it been good for you? It's been really, really good for me. Thank you. Why don't we all clap? One more time. Any more fun? That's the new rule. If one person claps, we all have to clap. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it's been really good for me reclaiming um, the awe of God that we have in our life. You know, it can be challenging in life uh, not to give our awe away to things that seem big, things that seem bigger than God. Not that they are bigger than God, but sometimes they seem bigger because, well, life's kind of hard. It's hard to stay in a place where God has arrested all of my awe and wonder, especially when we go through pain, when we have let down, when we have doubt, right? When we go through things that are really hard. I mean, I don't know about you, but have you ever prayed and asked God for something just to see it never come? Have you ever prayed and, and even begged God to save somebody or to heal somebody just to see their healing never come? Have you ever had a spiritual leader in your life that so encouraged you and you knew that they were from God and you looked up to them and they helped you and then they let you down? or they hurt you, or they messed up. We've all had experiences like that. Okay? It, it, whether you're in here today and you believe in God or follow Jesus or not, I think we all have experiences like that. You know, most people I know that claim to not believe in God, I don't think they're fully telling it like it is. After talking to them for some time, I realized it's not that they don't believe God exists, they just don't believe that God cares. Uh, will he speak? Will he move? Will he protect? I mean, he didn't do it last time. So why would I think he's going to do it this time? And all of a sudden, we lose our awe of God. It's gone. And when your awe of God is gone, all of a sudden, you start to believe that you already know God. I got him figured out. I got him pinned down. I know all there is to know about him. And once you think you know him, there's no room anymore to be in awe of him because we don't have faith for it. We don't have awe for it anymore. But I can tell you today, there's no possible way to get to the end of God. He, he is like an endless ocean, like we said a few minutes ago. There's no end to how many adventures he could take you on, new lessons he could teach you. He's not done revealing himself to you. 
He's not done moving through your life. We just need faith for it. And in this series, we've been talking about the things that steal that faith, the things that are hard, that, that take that away, that we're not in awe of God anymore. Today, we're talking about our past, our past that can so easily take our breath away. The thing that we often try and hide from people, we try and kind of keep it away, but deep down, we know it is there. It's the reality of where we've been, what we've done, or what's been done to us, right? And, and it leaves us kind of with a but. You know, I was going to serve God, but, man, you don't know where I've been. And so all of a sudden, now we, we have a past. And the text we're going to read about today, it's about a guy who can't seem to shake his past. No matter what he does, no matter where he goes, there it is. And some of us know exactly what that feels like. It feels like our, our past is chasing us. The guy we're going to read about today, his past is literally chasing him. His name is Moses. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 14. So if you've got a Bible today, you can pull it out. If you do not have a Bible, we're going to have it up on the screen. Exodus chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 10. A little bit of context today. It's really important. When you open up the book of Exodus, what you notice is that God's people, the Israelites, are in slavery. They're in slavery. And at this point, they're having so many babies that the Egyptians get scared that they're going to have too many people. And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he makes a law. He says, any newborn boy... Israelites, they're gonna, we have to kill them. We're going to kill them. That would include Moses, but long story show, short, Moses' mother hides him, saves him. Moses ends up growing up in Pharaoh's household. It's kind of a crazy story. As Moses gets older, he realizes, I'm not, I don't look like them. I'm not Egyptian. I'm actually an Israelite. So he realizes who his people are, and the fact that they're enslaved, it bothers him. It kind of shakes him. And so in one moment, all of a sudden, he sees an Israelite slave being abused, by an Egyptian soldier, and so in fear and insecurity, he just, he kills, he murders the Egyptian soldier, and I think that that was a crossroads moment for Moses, he says, you know, I, I came from the Israelites, but I grew up as an Egyptian, and in that moment, he was deciding, who am I going to be, am I going to be who I want to be, or am I going to be who I actually am, am I going to be who they want me to be, or am I going to be who I actually am, again, in one moment of impulse, he murders this guy, and he knows that he's going to get in trouble, and so in fear of what other people will think about him and ramification of what he did, he did what a lot of us do with our past. He didn't deal with it. He didn't handle it. He didn't process it. He actually ran away from it. He ran away to a place called Midian, which is about 1,500 miles away. And let's be honest, that's farther than some of you ran in your life, okay? He ran far away to get away, away from his past as fast as he possibly could. But don't you know that God finds him there and calls him back home? God actually comes and says, I need you to go back. And face Pharaoh. And facing Pharaoh would have been Moses' biggest nightmare because Pharaoh is the representation of his past. He's the representation of where he came from, Israelite slave. He's the representation of what he is not, a rich and powerful Egyptian. He is the representation of what was done to him as a small child. He was orphaned and kind of let go of. He's also the representation of what he did and who he became. He became a murderer. And so he did not want to face it, but God calls him back. And again, long story short, God does some, some plagues in this place. Pharaoh decides, let's let the people go. They leave. And as they're leaving, Moses changes his mind and says, hey, let's go chase down the Israelites. I want to make them my slaves again. And that's where we pick up the story. Exodus chapter 14 in verse 10. Are you there? I gave you, I tried to give you some time to find it. So that's what that was. You got five minutes and you found it. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10. Here's what it says. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up in panic when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and said to Moses, why? Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? A little bit sarcastic. What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this was going to happen? We told you back in Egypt this was going to happen. We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Okay, they don't seem very encouraged, you know, like things aren't going very well. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when following God, things get worse before they get better? It's as if God stacks the odds against himself before he moves. It's truly wild. But here's what Moses says to the people. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. He says the Egyptians, the slavery in your life, your past, who you were, what's been done to you, you see it today, but you'll never see it again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And at this point, they get backed up to a Red Sea. There's nowhere to go. they got a sea on one side and an army chasing them on the other. Skipping now to verse 21. It says, Then Moses said, set his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. 
The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land, so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. It's pretty amazing. And as they walked through, the Bible says the Egyptians chased them into it. Verse 26 now, it says, when all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into a sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. All of the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel, they walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. As the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And Israel saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. Verse 31, last verse. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, erasing their slavery and their past, says they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in the servant of Moses. Amen. And amen. God drowned their enemy. He drowned their past and their slavery, leaving it in the water. Really excited today to wrap up the series in awe with a message that I've entitled, I left it in the water. I left it in the water. Anybody in here today, you, um, you ever have a hard time letting things go? Is that you? Anybody? You just have a hard time letting things go. Some people in here, feel free to point at somebody. If you know it's them, you're like, it's them. Okay, maybe not your spouse because it could get ugly. Maybe save it for later. But, but, but sometimes in life, there's things that are hard to let go of, things that are hard to shake. Maybe it was something that somebody did to you. Maybe it was something that somebody said about you. Maybe it was something that somebody did without you, you know? Like maybe it was this great party and everybody was there. Everybody's talking about it. It was really fun, but you weren't invited. And even though it was in the sixth grade, you can't seem to let it go. You know, it was like over 20 years ago. It's like, man, you should pray about that. You should, you should let that go. Maybe it was a promise that somebody made to you. You know, like maybe in a great moment, your, your wife, your husband, or your roommate made a declaration in faith. I'm going to clean the kitchen this weekend. It was a good moment, but they never did it, you know. And the problem is now you're bringing it up seven months later. Yeah, you're in the middle of an argument. You said something you shouldn't have said. And, and, and they're like, why did you say that? Like, I'm just so upset. Why are you upset? Because you didn't clean the kitchen, you know, even though it was like forever ago. It's it just sometimes there's things that are they're hard to let go of. You know, in my life, there's something for me currently that's very hard to let go of. And, and it's this picture on my phone. You know, I'm a humble guy. I, got, I still got an iPhone 6, okay? And that's because I use like two apps. But sometimes I use my photos app. And there's this photo on my phone that I can't seem to let go of, okay? It's this picture of my wife and I before we had kids. And let's just say I look a little different. I do. I look a little different. I mean, there we are in the picture. We're having a great time. We're, we're on the beach in Cancun, just enjoying ourselves. My wife's there. She's looking gorgeous. I'm there shirtless. And again, I just, I look a little different than I do now because let's be honest, it's pretty crazy what a pregnancy can do to your body. It is. It is. It's crazy. And I'm speaking from firsthand knowledge because the, bot, the dad bot is real. Let me just tell you. The dad bot is real and it's an attack from the enemy. It's from hell. The, the, the temptations are real. And by temptations, I mean cravings, same thing, okay? Late night, in and out, ice cream, donuts, happiness. At the time, it didn't seem like an option. It was a need. It was a need. And these needs, they changed my life. I mean, I still have muscles. They're just on my hips now. You know, like things have changed for me a little bit. They have. And so every now and then in a moment of despair and weakness, I'll lay in bed at night and I will stare at this picture. After a night of Mexican food and Carne asada fries, sour cream and guac, maybe a side of cheesecake if I'm feeling crazy. And, and after that, I will stare at this picture and feel bad about myself. And I know what you're thinking. Dude, that's crazy. Why would you do that? You have problems. I know. That's why I'm here today. But, but why would you do that? You know, you should really let that go. You know, like, is it your family good enough? Why are you not happy? And so I should. You're right. I, I should let it go. But it's really hard for me to shake it, especially now because my wife is actually pregnant again. And we're having our next child in August. Thank you. You didn't need to do that. It's really exciting. It's exciting, and you should be excited. But I'm scared, okay? Because the first pregnancy really did a number on my body. I don't know what this one's going to do. It's really it's scary. I should let it go, but it's hard. Why? Because I did it to myself. And I think if we're being honest, 
here today, it, it's really hard to let go of what people do to us, but I think it's even harder to let go of what we do to ourselves. You know, what people do to you, you couldn't really control it. What they said about you, the things they did without you, you didn't like it, but you couldn't control it. But, but looking back at that situation, I had some kind of control, you know, like I didn't need to order animal fries. I could have ordered water, okay? I, I didn't need to order extra cheese a- every single time. I certainly didn't need to sign up for the rewards program. You know, I, I didn't need to do that, but I did it. And so looking back, it's, it's hard to let it go because I did it to myself. And I think that's actually makes it harder to let go of. But I got to tell you today, the devil would love nothing more than to remind you, to help you relive, play the tape, refresh you on every big mistake you've ever made to help you not let it go. Because he knows if you let go of what the devil had for you yesterday, then you can grab a hold of what God has for you tomorrow. And, you know, the Bible's pretty clear on what God has for us tomorrow. The Bible says God has a future and a hope for all of us. He's got plans. He's got good plans to move through our life, to leave us in awe. But there's a problem. The problem is our past. You see, the biggest deterrent to our future is our past. It's our butt. Anybody in here got a butt? B-U-T? Okay, B-U-T. It's I was going to serve God. But, man, I really messed up. Or God didn't give me the right opportunity or the right talent. I was going to give to God, but I blew all my money. Or God didn't give me enough money. I was going to wait to find a godly man to marry. But if you've seen my past, you know I don't deserve it. We, we all have some kind of but when God calls us to move forward. And what you need to know today is Moses had a really big one. See, I think without a doubt, if you read the Bible, what you find out is that Jesus for sure saw the most miracles. He saw God move in the most miraculous ways compared to anybody else in the Bible, constantly seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open, paralyzed people walking. He defeated death. I mean, he takes the cake, but I really think that the number two guy is Moses. Moses saw so many miracles. He saw God do crazy things. It was Moses that God used to administer the ten plagues in Egypt that freed the people in the first place. It was Moses that, that led the people to the Red Sea that God parted, which is a hundred mile wide sea. God, God parted it. He, he got to be a part of that. It was Moses that God gave the Ten Commandments through. It was Moses that stood in, in not just the presence of God, but the tangible presence of God. In fact, the Bible says that it was the cloud by day and the fire by night, God's presence that led them everywhere they went. They didn't need Siri. They didn't need maps. They didn't need map Quest, which is good because map Quest didn't work anyway. But they, they didn't need direction. They had God's presence. I mean, what Moses saw was crazy. Moses is the man. But until the age of 80, Moses is nothing more than a runaway criminal who murders somebody who's trying to hide out in some weird place out in the desert, living a life that's not really his with no hope or future at all. That's Moses. That's who he was till 80. And so when God comes and finds him there, he's a really messed up, broken guy. And by the way, where does God find this guy? God comes and meets with Moses in this place called Midian. And Midian is 1,500 miles away from where he's supposed to be. Isn't it interesting, though, that Moses doesn't go to God? God goes to Moses. Anybody thankful today that before you ever went to God, God came after you? Before you ever found him, he found you. Right? God doesn't love us because we love him, but it says that we love him because he loved us first. And so he goes all the way out in the middle of nowhere to find this guy, which is funny because a lot of people say, man, I'll go to church when I fix myself. I'll go to church when I erase my past. I'll go to church when I clean myself up a bit. As if you could clean yourself up enough to be justified to stand in front of God. You, you, you couldn't, right? I was broken, but Jesus came for me. I was lost in my past, but Jesus erased it. God doesn't use perfect people. He heals broken ones, like Moses. See, God goes all the way to Midian. Just in the middle of nowhere. It's like El Centro, man. Like, who goes there? Listen, if you're from El Centro, I love you. But come on, you know, like, let, let it go. I mean, he, he went in the middle of nowhere to find this guy. And, and, and that's how some of us are. We are hundreds of miles from our purpose and where we're supposed to be. God could never find me there. No, no, he, can, he could. He could absolutely find you there wherever you may be. And God goes all the way out to seek him. And it's like if God goes all the way out there to speak to you, the least you could do is say yes if he asks you to do something. Here's what Moses says when God says, hey, I need you to go back to Egypt. Exodus 4 and verse 1. Here's what he said. He said, I would, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say the Lord did not 
appear to you. Why wouldn't they believe you? Oh, yeah, you're a murderer. Forgot. Forgot. You murdered somebody and everybody knows it. Moses says, I would, God. I, really, I wouldn't. But you don't know where I've been. I'm kind of like a murderer, you know? Like, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You see, Moses is doing here what we often do. When God calls us forward, we look backward. We look back to who we used to be, and he lets his past disqualify his future. And, and if you can't relate to that in the Bible, I'm not sure what you could relate to. See, we've at some point become professionals in looking back at who we used to be, the sin of our past. And if you look back, it's actually that sin that pointed you to Jesus, that reminded you that you needed a Savior, but we don't really consider that. But rather, we act like Moses and we become full of shame and guilt. And I wish we could talk about shame for about two hours, but I'll just say this. Shame unjustly has a winning record in the church. It, it does, because it's built on one lie, and the lie is this, is that shame casts the wrong roles for the wrong character. And what I mean by that is this. If you follow Jesus today, which is a big if, if you follow Jesus today, this is what we often do with shame incorrectly. If we take the, the, the born again, new creation, captivated follower of Jesus of today, and we put him in the sin of yesterday, and it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. It, it's actually not a match. If we look in the mirror today, we know what we did. We know what they did. We remember the past sin or the past hurt, and we actually connect the dots. And that's actually not our right. We're not actually able to do that. Why? Because you do not have the right, biblically or theologically, to erase what Jesus did in your life. You can't do it. And so it's just a faith issue. Do you believe 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, if you're in Christ, you're new. You are a new creation. The old is actually gone. It's not that the old is on a coffee break. It's just, it's gone. It's gone. And so every time we take the sin of yesterday and put it on us today, we are creating a fantasy. It's actually not real. Not, by the way, spiritually speaking, it's not real. Right? If you hurt somebody in the past, that's a, that's a real thing. You need to walk through that. You need to be there for them. Okay, I'm not saying, hey, you owed your friend $100, but God forgave you. You don't owe him money. That's not what I'm saying. You know, like the Bible would teach you not only to pay him back, but and then some. It's called restoration. It's a different message. But if, if there's something that you did to somebody, you need to be there for them. You need to serve them. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But, but the shame that we carry, it's actually not real. And so the question you're left with is, do you have more faith in your sin or in the cross? Do you have more faith in your past or Jesus' past because the cross removed it? It's actually this idea the Bible calls remission. Remission. If we understood what remission meant, we would live totally different. Um, I'm going to say what it is in a minute, but here's what remission is not. This is what we often think it is. We think remission is temporary relief of my sin until I mess up again. You know, until I do something really bad again, which leaves God in heaven like, what? He did what? With who? Where? Oh! Oh, no, you know, like as if God didn't know we were going to do it. He's up in heaven like, you know what? Get another baby. Find another virgin. Let's get Jesus. Let's try it again. Maybe it'll work this time. Jesus doesn't need to die again for your past. He doesn't because he planned it the first time. That, that's not what remission is. Remission is what Psalm 103 says. As far as the east is from the west is as far as your sin has been removed from you. Remission is removal. It's totally casting it away. And God really hates when somehow, anyway, our past gets in the way of our relationship with God. It's not that God doesn't know about your sin. The Bible says he casts it into the lake of forgetfulness, meaning that what? The wages of your sin, he can't find them anymore. He's like, where did I put those? I don't, I don't know. He, he hid them from himself. It's not that he doesn't know what you did, right? His people's sin is documented in the Bible. Like he, he knows what they did, but here's what God does. He takes you over here and he takes your sin over here, and he just deals with it separately. He says, hey, can we have a relationship separate of this? And what happens is we, have, we often let sin be the third wheel in our relationship with God. And it keeps us from moving forward with him. And God hates that, especially when he sent his son to die for it. And so you're left with this question, do you have more faith in Jesus, or do you have more faith in your sin? And so when your past is on your mind, you're very, we're very cautious around God. We tiptoe around God. But when your Savior's on your mind, you run to God. It, you know you're free. You run to him even though you don't live a perfect life. It's been removed from you, by the way, not because of anything that you did. I mean, it's really funny if we go back and read the response that God had from Moses. We're not because of time. But if you want to read it later, it's in Exodus 4. 
Mo Moses says to God, but you don't know what I've done. It's so bad. And here's what God doesn't do. God's like, no, it's not that bad. You know you didn't murder anybody. No, they'll like you. You're a good guy. You're funny. They'll like you. He doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't do that at all. In fact, he's Moses like, no, I'm, it's so bad. And God's like, okay, what's in your hand? He's like a staff. Throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. The Bible would indicate that Moses is left in awe. Why, why would God do that? It's weird. Here's why. Because God's hope to you today it is not to tell you that you're better than you really are, but it's to give you a greater revelation of who he is. It's to give you a greater revelation of who he is. He leaves Moses in awe, not to remind him how great he is, but to remind him who's with him and who goes before him. Moses is like, no, it's so bad. I'm so bad. God's like, I know. That's why I'm here. You know, like we came there like it's so bad. God's like, I know. That's why I showed up. I, I came because of that. And so he does this to encourage Moses. Why? Because he knows that Moses is going to need an encouragement. Because Moses finds himself in the story that we just read about today, backed up against the wall. He's got the Red Sea on one side and Pharaoh on the other. He, he's got a wall for his future on one side and his past chasing him on the other. It would be really hard to have faith in that moment. Because why? Because faith is not visible. Purpose is often not visible. But having no problems are visible. Your past is very visible. A lot of us can see it. The problem is Pharaoh's chasing him, and if he gets him back, he's going to be a slave again. It, the problem is Moses is trying to leave who he used to be to be who he wants to be, to be who God's calling him to be, but his past won't let him go. And that's a problem for Moses and the people. That's why the people complain. They complain. And you see, we might be in a situation today, and we look at God, and we complain, and we say, why? Why? And that's probably because we are looking at what is happening, not why it is happening. And you cannot thank God for the what until you understand the why. And what I mean by that is you might be in a situation today that you don't understand. It might be really hard, but can I tell you that God can use it? And you might be exactly where God wants you, which is hard to understand, but you have to look at Moses' situation. Moses is a runaway slave. That's the life he's living. And even if he outruns Pharaoh, he's still a runaway slave. That's who he is. No matter where he went or what he did, he'd always have to look over his shoulder. Why? Because his past is still there. It's not dealt with yet. I think a lot of us live like that. We live like a run, runaway slave. Running, trying to run away from our past as long as we can, as far as we can to avoid it, is still there until it is dealt with and until it is killed. It is still there and we're still a slave to it. I mean, as long as you have an identity issue from your past, it doesn't matter what new things you are accomplishing. You're still a slave to that. It doesn't matter what, you know, if, if you have financial demons from your past, if you still have those, it doesn't matter what new money you make, you're still a slave to that. If you still have trust or forgiveness issues from your past, it doesn't matter what new relationship, oh, I'm, I'm another boyfriend, it's still there. You're still a slave to your past. As long as you let Pharaoh chase you, you you're still a slave to your past, because even though nobody else can see it, it's still there. I mean, even though Moses is temporarily free, he has the fear of what if Pharaoh gets me again? What if he gets me again? I wonder how many people in here today live with the fear of what if my past gets me again? What if it gets me again? I wonder how many people are afraid to be happy because what if it doesn't last again? Or how many people are afraid to, to love because, man, what if it goes wrong again? Maybe there's people in here you're afraid to try because, man, what if I fail again? And as long as we let Pharaoh chase us, we'll never be free. Living with the threat or the shame of your past is not living at all. And so God knows that, and he wants to do something about it. And so he leads Moses to the Red Sea. What do you, you mean? You mean the dead end place? The place where there was nowhere else to go? God led him there? God led him there. That's what the Bible says. But it also says that Moses chased him there. And so which is it? Was it God or was it the enemy? You know, sometimes you don't know. You could be in the fight of your life and you're like, how did I get here? Did God leave me here or did, 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 did the enemy chase me? You don't know. We don't know yet. But what we find out is that God led them there for a very specific purpose. Because God was done allowing Moses' past to remain in his life. God said, you know what? It ends tonight. It's done. 
I don't want you taking another day, another step, Moses, with, with your past and your future coexisting. They don't fit. They don't belong together. And so he leads him to a place where it gets exposed or gets let out. And it's a hard situation. But you got to know, sometimes God will lead you into something just to drown something in your life, just to drown your past, just to get rid of it. And so he's in this moment and he can't run anymore. There's no way he could run away from it. It has to be dealt with right here. But God leads him there. Why? To remind his past that it doesn't own him anymore. No, it says in, in the Bible there in Exodus 4, Pharaoh's like, hey, this guy, Moses, he's my slave. But then God finally declares, Exodus 4, 22, no, he's my son. Pharaoh's like, no, he's, he's my slave. God's like, no, he, he's my son. They're talking about the same person. Same discussion is being had about you. The thing that chases you is like, hey, this is my slave. God's like, no, th this, this is my son. This is my son. And so what we see in the story is that the slave goes in the water. But the son comes out because everything that was of God came out of the situation. But the thing that was not of God died in the situation. You know, sometimes God will lead you into something just to drown that which is chasing you. And, and you have to make a decision today. Which reality are you going to live in? Who you were or who you are? What they said about you or what God said about you? What your past says or where God's taking you? Which reality are you going to live in? You have to make that decision on your own. You have, to, you have to decide which reality you're going to live in because God will lead us into a Red Sea so something can drown because he doesn't want it to coexist with you and you get to decide who comes out, the slave or the son. Because way too often when God tries to lead us into who we are in Christ, we refer to him to who we were in the past. God's like, hey, I'm trying to give you this opportunity. Be like, hey, but you don't know what I did. You, know? you don't know where I came from. You don't know how they raised me. They abused me, you know. You'll, you'll never believe what they said about me. You'll never believe what, I, I just didn't get the same hand dealt to me as they did. I, I just, I messed up too bad. And God's like, hey, can we leave all that in the water? Can we leave it in the water? I, I didn't take you there so both would come out. One of them gets to drown so that the other one can live. Which one are you going to live in? That's why God led you to th the Red Sea. That hard situation, why? Because it's a good drowning place. You can't run from it anymore. There it is. People see it. They're like, oh, yeah, we see that. Who's going to move forward? You get to make a decision. I think sometimes, and I believe it's happening today, God creates a space, and it's like the Red Sea. And you get to decide, what are you leaving behind? Are you going to leave it in the water? That which haunts you. That which chases you, this is the place it ends. Leave it in the water. Don't leave here because it doesn't fit you anymore. Don't leave here with it. It doesn't make any sense. But you get to decide which reality you're going to live in. Is it what the world said about you? Is it what you say about you? Is it what God says about you? Leave it in the water. So here's what I want to do today. I want to pray for some people who got some things that are chasing them from their past. Things that people said about them. Look, we all have something. It might have been what your second grade teacher said to you when you were a kid. You'll never do anything. You're dumb. It might have been that your parents gave up on you. You were never close to your dad. I don't know what it is, but, but often it is our excuse for why we cannot move forward. We're like, God's like, hey, let's move forward. You're like, well, refer, we refer to what somebody said about us 20 years ago. So God wants to lead you to a place. Leave it in the way. Just leave it here. And so that's why I love church, because we can come and... It's actually a place where you can leave something. Like, don't, don't take it with you on the way out. But we're about to have a moment when we go and worship God. Leave it 